the real heart of the ball culture is family culture. And so these houses who are competing aren't just there for the performance. They are actually little families. They are they are looking out for one another. They are helping one another. They In sort of the regular, regular mm. like way that we conceive mm. a, a sort of family where there are mothers and fathers yeah. and children and stuff, these houses are constituted in the same sort of mm. way. So I'm very happy to have back in studio uh, Zoe Black, documentary filmmaker, photographer, um, because I've been jo- enjoying her documentaries and a series uh, a little bit more because I think it's great that she's also lifting the veil on, on queer culture um, from ball culture because it's, it's absolutely fascinating because it's like a voguing competition, but it's to another level. Uh, yeah, thanks for having me back again. Uh, it's good to be here. Nice to see your face again. Um, so yeah, I've been I've been doing a lot of work around this sort of like documentation around the queer culture in Cape Town specifically over the last couple of months, and really, really tried to dial in focus on that in terms of like sort of my like my documentation work. And I'd been attending balls, I think, since like 2021, 2022, and. I think at the beginning of this year, I, I worked an event with a friend of mine that was hosting a sort of like this legacy project called Salon QP. And it really dives into the sort of history around uh, queer and trans people in Cape Town specifically and the history around that and the history around queer people in District 6 and these kikis and these balls that they used to host here. And I think it was like over for me. Then and so these balls are these these events where queer people from all walks of life come together in like a space and just have a jaw. It is a very structured sort of event. It is a competition to a certain degree, um, and they've got various various categories that people walk. So some of them walk realness, some of them walk face. Some of them are voguing, and that's a category on its own, which is the like performance category. And there are prizes that people win, uh, and it, it's uh, it's quite it's quite an experience. Mm. Um, and I have loved shooting the the balls. It's, I, I've it's not have had experience of attending any balls here in, in, in Cape Town, but uh, on via social media and other channels, I've seen particularly. The voguing competitions, which which is almost Olympic level competitiveness, it's absolutely fascinating. Yeah, so I mean, so voguing as a category is a, I mean, it draws a lot of its sort of like uh, performance aesthetic from the same sort of roots that uh, break dancing does. So they they draw inspiration from the hieroglyphs from the Egyptians, right? Mm. So it's all about the long, the straight lines, the awkward positions. Mm. But then there's also a gymnastic sort of like component around it. And voguing is a very, as much as it is a, a sort of like a freestyle thing, it, it is a really, really technical performance. There, I think there are five different elements to voguing that you have to get right. And if you don't, the judges will read you for it and you will be chopped and <laughs> get off the stage. It's, so it, it, is, it, is, it is really, really incredible. Part of the work that I was doing initially when I started YouTube was around sort of like visibility work, right? And for so many people that I knew, I was the only trans person that they had ever met. And so I had become sort of an access point for them into uh, into queer life, uh, into uh, transgender, queer POC perspectives, and so the response has largely been really, really great and supportive. Mm. Um, I mean, a lot of my work is storytelling work and narrative work. And, and so there's a way to like, you know, craft narratives that that resonate with people, um, that resonate with people who are outside of the queer community as well. So the response has been really, really amazing. I, I, I think part of the this particular sort of focus of mine around the ball culture there's a very significant sort of place for it mm. here in Cape Town, specifically with the Cape Town community. Um, I mean, Ballroom started in the, what, 1970s, 1980s in Harlem, New York. Uh, and the houses were formed as a way to give 
a queer youth who had been thrown out by their families who wouldn't accept him of them a, a place and so the, these families formed and the while the balls in and of itself are performance mm. driven and it is a spectacle and it's an extravaganza and it is fabulous and amazing the real heart of the ball culture is family culture and so these houses who are competing aren't just there for the performance they are actually little families they are they are looking out for one another they are helping one another they in sort of the regular regular like way that we conceive a, a, a sort of family where there are mothers and fathers yeah. and children and stuff these houses are constituted in the same sort of way and so this notion of family uh, around i guess marginalized identities who have been sort of like pushed to the mm. to the edges are are finding homes and spaces for themselves and i think that's the thing about ball culture that i that I deeply, deeply connect I'm with. I'm speaking to Zoe Black, documentary film maker, has a, a fascinating YouTube channel. If I search back into my earliest memories, there were women who we now categorize as trans women who were part of my community, they were part of the friends of my family. When my mother would go to a hairdresser, the person who was at the, the hairdresser, one, two, or three, or people would now say, "Oh, they're 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 trans woman." That wasn't a conversation in the 1980s when I was growing up, but has now become almost front and center of a culture war now in 2024. I mean, like trans people have, have existed like forever. We have like we have like actual documentation around this from like cultures all over the world. Um, while the language around transness didn't necessarily look the way that it does right now, I mean, like the, 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 even the word transgender is a relatively new term in our sort of like, I guess, modern lexicon, right? Um, it's now that we've named things. It's now that we're, that queer people and trans people are now asserting the identities and demanding sort of their basic human rights around it, that it's become the sort of, conversation mm. let's let's put that lightly um and, and, so, and so it's a difficult thing because uh, we want people to catch up to the language mm. um and we want people to understand the concepts but it is simultaneously a difficult thing because people are fighting against that and mm. it's not just a a culture issue it's 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 very much a human rights thing bev sends a message she says queer balls as a very young straight woman i had the great luck to have many gay friends in the early 70s and attended the wonderful balls at maud's dance emporium near the docks it was the only place where you could dance through saturdays into sundays when dances were illegal so it was a gay place and the police sometimes raided but it was a warm free place of expression and at a new year's eve ball there such fun it was absolutely smart that's dr beverly rose muller who is a, who is a historical author uh, that gives that gives credence to what you've been saying this is nothing novel we've been having these these spaces of gathering for years. This, the story of QP in District 6 is absolutely inspirational. It's just, we're now talking about it. We're mainstreaming it. I mean, this is like part of like the, the sort of like erasure of the culture in a particular way. These spaces have been happening. These events have been happening. We are here. We've been here. And whether we like to admit it or not it's very likely that for so many people particularly here in cape town they may have known somebody who was trans they have probably been around people who were going to these events at the time we must also understand the historical context around that that it was like a little bit difficult to be out back then um and be out and loud about it and so Part of that erasure of that culture is is the silence around stuff, and and I think now in the in the age where you know the internet has sort of like democratized us to a large degree, and everybody can share their story and their stuff, um, I th I think people are now people are saying these things out loud, and we're going, oh my god. I used to go to so-and-so who used to cut my hair and my mommy also did this and this and this with this person, and then you go, oh, but that's the same person that we're talking about. And that's the same places that we used to frequent. QP was a a, a, a hairdresser later in in the Maitland, in the Mil, not Maitland Milderton in the Kensington area, area. Yeah, and yeah. became quite famous. But but has now this historical weight of of, of a pioneer. Yeah, it's so funny because um, 
I, so I was I was shooting the the QP the salon QP event, and part of those workshops they were they had like these panel discussions and um, they were talking about where QP used to cut hair and where the salon was and I was like, my grandmother used to live there, and then I just did a little bit of digging, and turns out that my grandma got her hair cut by QP. Cap is clean. The cap is clean. Zoe Black, go to that YouTube channel, search Zoe Black Z O E Y. Black, go learn, go be entertained. Zoe, pleasure as always. Thank you so much.